So our next speaker is Ana Maria Raclario. She's going to tell us about celestial amplitudes from flat space limits of ABS weekend diagram. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I would uh, like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to speak here. It's a real pleasure to be able to tell you um, about some recent work from last month with Leonardo de Gioia, who is a grad student in uh, uh, Unicamp, Brazil. So um, let me start by saying that um, one of the outstanding goals in quantum gravity is to find good observables. Uh, and probably many people would agree that when it comes to asymptotically flat spaces, um, a good candidate um, uh, such observables are scattering amplitudes. So these are the building blocks for uh, most observables that we, uh, we, we can construct, and they have many nice properties. So uh, let me just mention uh, two of them. So one of them is that they are calculable in perturbation theory, and indeed it, uh, there has been a lot of progress recently coming from amplitudes communities in computing amplitudes uh, in gravity with increasing order of uh, precision to increasing powers of, uh, of genetics. Newton, uh, and the scattering amplitudes allow us to extract information about things like gravitational uh, wave observables and so on. Now, another uh, nice property is that they uh, give us a window into properties of quantum gravity in that their low energy expansions are constrained by physically motivated assumptions such as unitarity and anal analyticity. Uh, unfortunately, in fourth dimension, uh, they do have some problems, so they suffer from infrared divergences. And uh, most importantly, if we're interested in constructing observables valid to all energies, um, at, the, at the moment we lack uh, uh, methods to compute scattering amplitudes uh, to, you know, to all orders non-perturbatively and so on and so forth. Now, uh, another set of observables that have been recently proposed uh, and nicely reviewed by Andy already are celestial amplitudes. So uh, uh, celestial amplitudes are nothing but uh, S matrices, but computed in a basis of energy, uh, of, of boost eigenstates instead of the usually uh, used energy momentum eigenstates. And uh, celestial amplitudes, um, by construction, they have the same, they encode the same uh, information as scattering amplitudes. However, they uh, are nice in that they make um, the infinite dimensional symmetries of four dimensional asymptotically flat space times more manifest. So these include BMS symmetries, Virasoro symmetries, more recently discovered the uh, higher spin uh, W infinity symmetries, and uh, so on and so forth. And we don't know what all of the symmetries are uh, that constrain uh, gravitational scattering uh, um, in four dimensions. Now, uh, another uh, nice thing about celestial amplitudes is that they reformulate the scattering problem in gravity in terms of a two-dimensional problem um, uh, that is constrained by conformal symmetry. And uh, in, in this framework, infrared divergences, or at least certain infrared divergences, can be nicely captured by vertex operators. Now, uh, of course, celestial amplitudes also have problems, so... Um, we lack tools to calculate them. Um, and uh, moreover, we don't know all of the properties they obey. Now, um, holography, more generally, turns out to be useful for many things, but also to understand aspects of the S matrix in uh, asymptotically flat spacetimes. And the story actually dates back to Polchinski, uh, um, late 90s. And uh, to summarize uh, the story, it's, uh, it's telling us that uh, actually uh, ADS-CFT observables, such as uh, conformal correlation functions, encode some information about the flat space S matrix in a large ADS radius limit. So there are two approaches here. Um, one of them is based on the HKLL construction, where, uh, roughly speaking, a boundary operator is related to a mode of a bulk flat space scattering field in the limit as uh, the ADS radius goes to infinity. And then the other approach relies on this interesting uh, dual representation of conformal correlation functions uh, in terms of uh, uh, these delta ij's, which are variables dual to the conformal invariants that characterize uh, uh, endpoint correlation functions in uh, generic conformal field theories. So these objects here are, are called Mellon correlators, M, and they have, they were shown that in a large uh, uh, delta ij limit, they uh, 
um, map onto flat space scattering amplitudes. So the story has been particularly, uh, particularly relevant in, uh, in understanding, uh, in formulating the S-matrix bootstrap program for, uh, for flat space. Now, uh, uh, given these uh, nice history um, of the S matrix, the flat space S matrix from uh, ADS-CFT, one could ask a natural question, namely uh, whether these uh, other observables that I introduced, uh, celestial amplitudes, can also be obtained uh, in, uh, in a flat space limit. And we do expect uh, this to be possible because, as I said before, celestial amplitudes do transform nicely under some kind of boundary conformal field theories. So uh, this brings me to the uh, outline of my talk. So uh, the key uh, point I want to make in this talk is that one can obtain uh, quite a general uh, celestial conformal field theory uh, amplitudes from a particular uh, flat space limit of ADS uh, Witten diagrams in two dimension higher with particular kinematics. And then I'm going to illustrate this idea in an example. So uh, this is a, a little bit non-trivial, namely the propagation of a particle in a shockwave background. Um, so we'll see how, uh, how the ADS result uh, maps precisely to the celestial result in a flat space limit. And then I will discuss the related problem of uh, uh, universal regime in celestial CFT uh, that has to do with the so-called iconal uh, exponentiation of T-channel exchanges. Okay, so to start off with, a uh, very brief introduction to celestial amplitudes. So if you want the computer scattering amplitude, uh, the first thing you, you have to do is to solve the scalar wave equation. So let me just say that at the moment I'm going to focus on four dimensions and the scattering of mass of scalars. So this is the simplest thing you could consider. Uh, and uh, uh, in solving this equation, one has a choice uh, of what solutions, what wave functions one can use. And it turns out to be convenient to, uh, to solve these equations with so-called conformal primary uh, wave functions, as opposed to the more standard uh, uh, plane waves. And how do we construct these? Well, uh, this, this was nicely done in this work here. Um, but the idea is to, uh, instead of diagonalizing uh, the translation generator is one instead diagonalizing the pair of commuting uh, boost, uh, uh, sorry, the Lorentz generators, so boosts and rotations. Uh, so this is just saying that the asymptotic particles are scalars, and this is the condition that these wave function diag that diagonalize boosts. And moreover, one imposes a highest weight condition on these wave functions. So this is uh, here. And it turns out that the set of conditions is solved by these wave functions uh, that are were called conformal primary wave functions, um, uh, and they have nice they transform nicely, namely as uh, primary operators uh, in a two-dimensional conformal field theory with respect to the Lorentz group that acts like the global conformal group on the sphere at infinity. Now, celestial amplitudes, which I'm going to denote by tilde, a tilde here, they uh, can be then constructed uh, from uh, time-ordered amputated bulk correlation functions in position space, integrated against these conformal primary wave functions, one for each of the external particles. Um, oh, and this is just to say, just to explain here, that they, they depend on two things. Uh, these conformal primary wave functions, they depend on a point x in the bulk, and they also depend on a null vector that, uh, whose spatial component is essentially the normal to the sphere at, uh, to the sphere at infinity. And this era variable distinguishes between incoming and outgoing uh, conformal primaries. Now, what's the connection with the more standard definition that involves the Mellon transform? Well, it's simple. We know that uh, momentum space carrying amplitudes are given by the same integrals of these time order correlation functions against plane waves instead. Um, and uh, it's easy to see that upon taking a Mellon transform of this object and using the fact that the Mellon transform of a plane wave is precisely the conformal primary wave function I introduced before, one arrives at this definition I put on the previous slide. And this construction, and it's going to be important for what I'm going to say next, can be generalized to higher dimensions. So it's not unique to four-dimensional uh, asymptotically flat space-times and two-dimensional uh, celestial conformal field theories. Now, uh, let me now um, uh, switch gears and uh, go to, to ADS. This is, every, everyone uh, here uh, knows this, but let me just briefly set up the notation. Um, uh, I'm going to be working with uh, uh, D plus one dimensional ADS spacetime that um, 
can be uh, embedded in a d plus two dimensional flat space, and the embedding is given here, where this tau is a um, decompactified uh, global co time coordinate in ADS. Uh, this row is a radial coordinate, and these omegas uh, label the angular directions uh, in this ADS space time. And I'm always going to denote bold x points, points in the bulk of ADS, and uh, by bold p's, points on the boundary, which can be obtained from, uh, from <laughs> by pushing bulk points uh, all the way to the boundary, which is the limit as this radial coordinate uh, row in this parameterization goes to pi over two. And then, as you already heard from Costas yesterday, scalar Witten, or Witten diagrams more generally are obtained by integrating uh, bulk to bulk propagators against bulk to boundary propagators uh, over all, all the points at which they join in the bulk of ADS. Okay, so uh, the flat space limit uh, of uh, ADS is uh, simply given by um, setting the global ADS time coordinate to, to T divided by R and this radial coordinate by R divided by R, where big R is the ADS radius. And then it's defined by taking the, the limit as the ADS radius goes to infinity for fixed uh, T and R, which ultimately will become uh, a, time, a time coordinate and the radial coordinate in the flat uh, uh, D plus one dimensional Minkowski space. And so the main result that I want you to take home from, from this talk is that uh, at the moment scalar ADS D plus one Witten diagrams uh, with boundary operators that are inserted uh, with a global time separation of pi reduced to celestial amplitudes to leading order in, in this flat space uh, R goes to infinity limit, provided that these two spheres on which they are inserted are antipodally matched. So let me sketch how this works. So uh, it's not hard to show this by analyzing just the constituents, the ingredients that make up an ads witten diagram. So let's start with the bulk to boundary propagators. These are given by this expression here. And one can just use the global, the parameterization I introduced before to uh, uh, put the bulk to boundary propagator into this form. So here, uh, the coordinates that have subscript P refer to coordinates for operators insertions on the boundary and the rest refer to points in the bulk. So this, this guy depends on a point on the boundary and a point in the bulk. Um, and the, the main observation here is that unless the operator on the boundary is inserted as a special at a special global time, namely tau equal to either plus pi over two or minus pi over two, in the flat space limit, this bulk to boundary propagator is gonna fall off as some power of r to the delta. Delta is typically positive in a unitary conformal field theory with a bulk gravity dual, and, and hence this is gonna go to zero. However, at these special times, uh, when, when, when this tau p is either plus pi over two or minus pi over two, one finds that the bulk to boundary propagators to leading order in a one over r expansion precisely reduce to the conformal primary wave functions that I introduced before. And here, let me just point out that um, there is a distinction between one gets precisely the uh, I epsilon prescriptions associated to outgoing versus incoming conformal primary wave functions. And in order to get uh, wave functions that obey Lorentz invariance in the bulk, uh, the two, these two spheres, so this, uh, this sphere has to be antipodally related to this other one. Okay, so how about the other uh, components? So uh, for the bulk to bulk propagator, one of course can also study the limit, uh, the flat space limit of an ADS bulk to bulk propagator, but it's simpler to see what's happening by just looking at the defining relation for a bulk to bulk propagator in ADS. And it's not hard to see that uh, as one takes the ADS radius to infinity, the, this differential operator here, the Laplacian reduces to the flat space Laplacian. Uh, this delta function and ADS reduces to leading order to a, to a flat space delta function. And hence, one finds that, uh, that to leading order in a larger ADS limit, the ADS bulk to bulk propagator has to uh, coincide with the flat space propagator. So one comment here is that um, one obtains massive exchanges in the limit uh, as one takes r to infinity uh, and also scales delta with r appropriately, so keeping m fixed, while for just uh, arbitrary delta that doesn't scale with r, one will obtain mass 
less exchanges. And finally, the last ingredient are the vertices. So uh, in the formula I presented before, one has to integrate over all bulk points. And it's not hard to see that just by construction, the, in the flat space limit, the measure reduces, the, the, this ADS uh, d plus 1 measure reduces to the flat space measure. So to summarize, uh, what we have found is that um, if we take an ADS uh, uh, Witten diagram or uh, equivalently a conformal correlation function in D dimensions and put the operators on the boundary in a particular kinematic configuration where part of them are placed on some slice at some arbitrary global time, so here I'm just taking it to be minus pi over 2, and the other operators are placed at uh, global times uh, la later by pi, so here at plus pi over 2, in the flat space limit, the ADS d plus 1 Witten diagram reduces precisely to a celestial uh, d minus 1 uh, 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 amplitude. So note that this, by, by the definition I've given before, uh, this will actually be a celestial amplitude as all of the insertions here will be on some d minus one dimensional sphere. So this is, this is one of the main results, main result number one. Now, uh, let's illustrate how this works in, uh, in an example. So let me consider a shock wave in flat, in flat space. So here is the metric. It's an exact solution to Einstein's equations, provided that this, uh, this g minus minus component obeys the uh, scalar wave equation in the transverse plane. And given this, uh, this metric, one Oh, sorry, I should say scalar wave equation in, in the transverse plane, but with a source. Um, and uh, one can study the propagation of a scalar in this background, and this takes, uh, the, this, just the wave equation in this background takes this form, and it's well known since the work of Tooft a long time ago that as the particle propagates through this shock wave, it will acquire a time delay, uh, and this time delay is captured by a phase that depends on this function h. And this fact can be used, uh, so namely the overlap between the initial wave function of this particle and the final wave function of this particle um, can be computed then and put in momentum space to give the two-point function uh, of this particle in a shockwave background. So this takes this form. Now, it's not hard to take that result and put it in a conformal primary basis. All one has to do is to take a Mellon transform with respect to the energies that we've seen before, omega 2 and omega 4. And upon doing so, one arrives at this formula that is the celestial amplitude associated with, uh, with the propagation of a scalar in a shockwave background. Now, um, about 15 years ago, there's been this uh, very interesting work uh, by Cornel Bacosta and Penedonis, where um, th this shockwave calculation, so namely the, the propagation of a particle in a shockwave background, was generalized to the case where the shock lies in ADS instead. And I'm not going to have time to describe that calculation, but what they found is that in ADS, the shockwave two-point function uh, uh, of two identical dimension operators takes this form. And if you look at these two expressions, they look very much similar. Uh, there are some differences, namely here this transverse integral is over a, a, a two-dimensional hyperbolic space rather than just a two-dimensional transverse flat space. Uh, this function h here obeys the scalar wave equation with a source uh, in, the, in a transverse hyperbolic space instead. And this, these points, uh, this q24 with it parameterize the positions of the points on the boundary, they depend also on the times at which the operators are inserted. So it's not super obvious how these two expressions are related, but given the general construction I described before, one can actually uh, take the ADS formula and follow the recipe that I proposed, uh, that I sort of demonstrated at the beginning. So take one operator and put it in so at some reference time. Uh, uh, take P2 and put it in so some reference time uh, tau equal to zero and take P4 and push it all the way uh, to, ta uh, to, to tau equal to pi. And in this limit, as one takes R to infinity, keeping T and R fixed, what one effectively does is one zooms into a, a small region centered around a, a shock wave in the bulk. And one can show that this shock wave two-point function in ADS precisely reduces to the flat space celestial amplitude. Okay? Now, uh, this story uh, is related also to uh, the high energy uh, uh, 
two, 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 two scattering regime. So uh, two, two, two scatter, this in, in, in the case of uh, two, uh, two, two, two scattering and high energies, it's been uh, again known for a very long time that um, two leading order uh, in the ratio of, of appropriately uh, S over T, uh, this two, two, two scattering amplitude actually is dominated by T channel exchanges. And it's also, uh, and here, sorry, here is the formula for the so-called iconal amplitude in momentum space. Uh, and it's been known that this iconal uh, resumation of T-channel exchanges is related to this two-point function uh, that I presented before, namely the propagation of a particle in a shockwave background. So there is, again, an interesting story presented in these works um, that generalizes this to ADS. And that has uh, interesting implications because the ADS story suggests that there exists a universal regime in uh, conformal field theory in which uh, so-called the regge uh, the regge limit, uh, in which uh, sort of conformal correlation functions they uh, have a universal form. So the natural question is whether one. Uh, one expects this to happen in celestial CFT as well, and given the general, again, given the general arguments before, one uh, expects the answer to this question to be yes. So uh, let me just sketch very briefly the calculation of this uh, diaconal amplitude in the celestial CFT. So what one has to do is to sum over all amplitudes involving n exchanges at fixed n uh, one has to sum over all ladders and cross ladders and then evaluate this using the position space rules, but now in a basis of conformal primary wave functions instead of the standard uh, plane waves instead. Now, uh, key in this calculation to be able to, to, sh uh, to say that this celestial, this, the resulting celestial amplitude is actually dominated by these T-channel exchanges, one has to take the conformal cross ratio on the sphere, which is just the ratio between the momentum transfer in the bulk and the center of mass energy, uh, to be small. And the other thing one has to do is to take two of the external dimensions, uh, namely that those of the incoming particles, to be large. So this is essentially this condition. Uh, what it does, it essentially puts these two external propagators on shell. And what one can do in a conformal primary basis, it turns out that these, uh, all of these internal lines uh, associated with the 1, 3, and the 2, 4 lines, they uh, become operator valued on shell on shell propagators. So I won't have time to discuss that calculation, but let me just uh, show you the formula that one gets at the end of the day. So this is reminiscent of the flat space formula. However, one has this conformal uh, wave function like looking factors here. Um, and one has this iconal phase that is very similar to the, to the phase in flat space. However, instead of factors of the energy here, one has these weight shifting, dimension shifting operators. So we have uh, an operator value, diconal phase. So this acts uh, order by order in a small g expansion. It acts on this factor to shift the dimensions, delta 1 and delta 2. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, what one can do is to check that in perturbation theory, this leads to the expected results, at least to, uh, to leading order in, uh, in an expansion in power of uh, g, in powers of g. And another interesting thing is that this formula, if you study this work uh, I, uh, by uh, Costa, Cornalba, and Panedones, it looks very similar to the formula in ADS, and one can show that it's indeed related to the shockwave calculation I, be, uh, I presented before for a particular choice of the source. So uh, here is the summary. So uh, I first uh, showed you how to quite generally obtain celestial amplitudes for d minus one dimensional celestial CFT from a flat space limit of ADS d plus one Witten diagrams. And I have showed how, uh, how this prescription actually works explicitly in the example of uh, the scattering of a particle in a shockwave background, but put on the celestial sphere. And I have then discussed this iconal regime in celestial CFT, which is a little bit reminiscent of the corresponding regime in conformal field theories uh, in which uh, the cross ratio is small and these external dimensions are taken to be large. So uh, since I'm out of time, here are some questions. Uh, so first of all, to relate to Andy's talk, uh, this suggests that perhaps one can uh, do some sort of top-down construction of celestial CFTs starting from uh, known dualities uh, in ADS, and in particular ADS4 CFT3 would be maybe relevant here to four-dimensional asymptotically flat spacetimes. Then it would be super interesting to see how to uh, obtain these infinite dimensional symmetries of asymptotically flat spacetimes from uh, this flat space limit by an 
analyzing the symmetries of CFT3 co correlators, somehow we have to have some, uh, some sort of BMS symmetries emerging in this uh, once one restricts the operators to some slices. It would be interesting to, uh, to study scattering in other backgrounds. Uh, this all has to do with causality uh, in the bulk, so, uh, and hence there should be some causality signatures in celestial conformal field theory, and this, more interestingly, this could be related to memory effect in, in flat space times. And finally, uh, this seems to me to be a very interesting relation between uh, Weinberg's infrared divergent phases that he computed in 65 and these iconal amplitudes that uh, have to do with very high energy scattering and sort of fixed mo uh, momentum transfer. Thank you. No questions? <laughs> Hi. Uh, so, uh, according, according to the first point here, um, do you know what happens to the operator product expansion under this limit? And do you also know, for example, what happens to the crossing equations in this limit? Yeah, that would be very interesting. That would be the next thing to, to look at. So I haven't looked at it yet, but there is been, I should point out that there was an interesting work by Hogerworth where the, just from a purely conformal field theory perspective, the conformal block decomposition of a, of a d-dimensional conformal field theory was studied uh, upon restricting, upon some dimensional reduction, where one preserves just a subgroup of the conformal group. And what they found in that, in that work is that one finds an infinite number, that the, that the higher dimensional conformal block decomposes into an infinite number of lower dimensional conformal blocks. And that kind of resonates a little bit with the things we have in, in celestial CFD, and it would be very interesting to study that further, but I haven't looked at it. And would that maybe be related to some kind of loss of locality? <laughs> that would be interesting to, to see. I, I, I don't know at the moment. Uh, which, which one? Like, me or him? Okay, all right. So, so let me just start. So, so um, is there any like uh, ADS analog of uh, to come to signature? Does it have any nice ADS CFD interpretation? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I would expect to to start with with instead of Lorentzian ADS, maybe start with two 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 for example for ADS for signature and see what happens in different upon analytic continuations and so on and so forth. But I haven't thought about that. No, not yet. Yeah, um, the picture you drew of a Tufts shock wave, it <coughs> sure looks like it's generating a super translation, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, let's go back to it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In, so, in do you know, space, that's clearly a super translation. Yeah, this, but, but you see, it's not, I think we discussed this before. It's not, uh, I mean, this is a shift in, 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 in time that depends on the angle at which the particle crosses this planar or this is the planar case, and there's been some hints, and you know, I mean, in the literature that perhaps these time delays have to actually be, well, these time delays are actually related to super translations, and hence this would kind of suggest that maybe causality would say that super translations, these functions appearing in the super translations have to be positive, but I'm not sure, such constraints have not really been, I think, like fully nailed down. One has, they're probably related by a gauge transformation, right, these, these time delays and the, and the okay. super translations that are, yeah. I see. And in our work, I guess we, that I just talked about, we were encountering ads Witten diagrams uh, for uh, ads d minus one or something. And right, you're, that's right. And you're right. in ads d. Yes, I, I know. <laughs> I would like to understand so somehow this. Somehow they should reduce time to, yeah. They should be the related. Periodicity conditions, somehow. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Any more questions? There is an announcement by the organizers. Thank you. So this afternoon we will have the gong show and you of course uh, we hope that you all will come there also because directly afterwards we will take the conference photo so make sure that you're there then you can be on the photo after taking the photograph we will have the prize ceremony 
uh, of the gong show and poster prizes. They will be announced after the conference photo. Another announcement is uh, please always wear the badge for the lunch breaks. If for some reason you have lost yours or forgot, just see the conference office. We'll uh, find, find a way. It's just because it's a public building. People can go in and uh, the caterer has to look for the badges. The conference office is always your friend, so not just with uh, lost or forgotten badges, but also if you, for example, lost something, we found a blue cap yesterday at the dinner uh, and a brown notebook in the coffee break, they are also there. If you need to print something like boarding pass, whatever, also see the conference office. And as always, leave the Audimax, please. We'll lock it until 1.30. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>